Hello, everyone. I'm Sheriff Wayne Ivey, the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. It's time for another great episode of On the Go with BCSO. Got my main man, Jay Martinez, here. Jay, how you right, doing, my good, brother? Good, good. Doing good? Yep. All right, so today we've got an exciting show for you. We're going to talk about the aviation unit of the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. And uh, you, if you live in Brevard County, you've had a chance to see them work because they're the eye in the sky for us. And we got our chief pilot, John Coppola, with us today. John, welcome, my friend. Glad Thank to have you, you here. I, when he first sat down, I thought it was Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry with his, uh, <laughs> with his uh, yeah, shoulder holster on. You know, so. <laughs> so, but hey, you know, I mean, I, I was wrong. So, uh, John, you've been with the sheriff's office how long now, my brother? Uh, 40 years. Oh, holy cow. Yeah. How old are you, John? Uh, not even 40. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I started when I was uh, 12, I think. Yeah, 12 years old. Uh, yeah, he lied so on his application. He got in. So. Yeah. Now, you have um, the aviation unit for the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. And yes, let's let's uh, start. Let's go back before Brevard County had an aviation unit. What were you doing then? Um, my first uh, 16 years or so, I was on the road, went through my ranks on the road from deputy to lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in special ops for a little while and ran special ops. And then uh, they gave me, as part of special ops, aviation. So as aviation got bigger, I ended up just taking over aviation. Yeah. Now, were you already a pilot? Uh, no, actually, I learned at the sheriff's office. A couple of the guys learned at the sheriff's office. So they gave you aviation and you weren't a pilot? <laughs> no, I actually uh, I, I took some ground school on my own and uh, actually I read a book. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know. Aviation for dummies. <laughs> yeah, well, but, uh, yeah, it was a little bit rough in the beginning, so, to say the least. <laughs> but uh, but it worked out. Yeah, yeah no, I, I would say it worked out great, my brother. So now. Fast forward, you're over the aviation unit. You're one of our one of our pilots, and I've had the the opportunity to fly with you, and um, absolutely smooth up there. So, um, any idea how many hours you have total hours uh, behind the stick? Uh, about three thousand or so, I think. Yeah, three thousand oh, wow. plus. Yeah, yeah. and a, a unique thing about our pilots is a lot of their flight time versus other pilots, uh, a lot of their flight times at night. Um, it is because yes. uh, because of your assistance with patrol and the different things you do. So, so let's talk about the aviation unit as a whole. Um, how many how many aircraft do we have? We've got uh, five operational helicopters. Two are used for rescue work. Uh, one of them is used also for firefighting. Okay. And so we work very closely with Brevard County and the Bambi bucket, um, uh, dropping water and stuff like that for the major fires and stuff. Yes, we do. We also, and, I, and one of the things that I found um, pretty fascinating when I came here is we do a lot of search and rescue um, off the coast and, and supporting the Coast Guard. Yes. Sir. And uh, I think the closest helicopter that the Coast Guard has to us is Jacksonville, if I remember correctly. Is that still accurate? Um, Jacksonville, Clearwater. Yeah, yeah those so, are about the same. You know? Yeah, so so <laughs> we're doing a lot of the, the water rescues and things like that around the, um, the, the coastline for us and stuff. So now, how many pilots you got? Uh, right now, we have five full-time pilots that operate there. There's two actually that are actually seven. The two that work nights are infrared operators and pilots as kind of a backup. Right. So. Yeah, so we have pilots, and then we have tactical flight officers. Yes, sir. And what, what, what's the, the tactical flight officer doing? As you said, I know we have a couple of them that um, are, um, are also pilots, but they're sitting in the TFO seat um, on yes, a lot of those missions. So what is the tactical flight officer doing? He's uh, operating the camera. He's running the infrared system. Okay, so and also he's, yeah, he's also uh, doing a lot of the talking to the ground units of what's going on so the pilot can concentrate on his job of flying the aircraft. The two night guys are full-time, and then in the daytime, we have it spread out among some of our people and some of the cities actually work with us, too. Right. So. Yeah, the cities, uh, some of them put in a, a TFO because we fly missions for them. Um, yes, sir. In, yes. In the area. <laughs> now, in addition to... Um, our, our pilots and our tactical flight officers, we have a couple other people out there that are vital to the success of that program, and that's that's our aviation mechanics yes, that are out there. Tell me a little bit about them and what they do on an average day. Um, they drive me crazy most of the time, but no, <laughs> no, they're, they're actually, no I, I said the mechanics, not Jay. So, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they are, they're actually, actually, they really, they're kind of the heart of the operation, to be honest with you. They, they're, the two of them that we have, um, one of them is actually a pilot, too, so right. he substitutes as both, and, um, you know, they're fantastic, really. They do all the overhaul work except for major stuff like the engines, which go to an engine shop. But everything else is pretty much done in-house and um, saves us a lot of money, keeps the aircraft in top-notch condition. They have a lot of experience to both of them. They've been around helicopters for a long time. So 
I rely on them really heavily to, to keep the aircraft in the condition they're in. So and it's always nice to have a guy who flies and fixes it. Right, because like day. Mike, Mike, you're talking about, Mike's there turning wrenches at one point, and we get yeah. a call out, and he's he's flying the, the uh, unit the next uh, five minutes later. Yes, so, exactly. Um, now, you have your pilots, the TFOs, you have your mechanics, you have one other... Um, a component out there that's vital to the success of, of your unit. Who, yeah, the what cat. That's the cat. Yeah, you already so, know the cat. Yeah, out yeah. So, cat. Vinny the cat. Vinny yeah, the cat. I don't know anything about this guy. He's out yeah. there. Yeah, he's out there keeping the mice out of the. No, he's not. So. so listen, here's what they, they got him because they said he was going to keep the mice out of the avionics and stuff. Right. But um, if you've seen him, um, he couldn't catch. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's eat so much that I'm, I'm not even sure he'll fit up into compartments anymore with the mice with pipes. <laughs> biggest cat I've ever, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's like a lion. He's yeah. not really a cat anymore. So, but, yeah, so Vinny's out there, and, and uh, he's, he's a, a staple of the operation. Yes, there. he is. So, now, you also have some others that um, help out, and they're, they're reserves um, that come in. Yeah, I have um, uh, Jeff O'Brien. Yeah. Um, if anybody would know Jeff, he's one of the doctors in town. Also, Scott DeMasso, he's from the Honda dealership, and he's... Uh, the both of them, Ron Stories, another local guy who's one of the reserves. Yeah. Um, they all. Yeah, all, Vinny. Vinny um, who the cat's named after? Um, you got Vinny. Vinny. Yeah, he's yeah. a reserve now. Yeah. yeah, he needs a new little blanket like him. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but all of them do spectacular things in the unit. Um, all of them have helped with everything from building buildings to you know just working in the helicopter itself too, right so yeah. yeah yeah i think it's neat to, you know because you're talking about uh, people that are very successful outside of law enforcement um, obviously scott owning his business in the in the car dealership jeff o'brien very recognized uh, uh, a surgeon here in our community and and uh you know these these are guys that are coming out donating hundreds if not thousands of hours of their time to to help your unit out there. So take me through an average day um, for one of our team members. Um, they work 12-hour shifts. They work 12-hour shifts. Um, you know, when you get there in the morning, first thing you do is pre-flight, pre-flight the helicopter. From there, uh, you always have your radio on. You're always scanning all the channels in the county, listening to what's going on in the cities as well as with the sheriff's office. 52% um, of the calls in the unit is sheriff's office calls. 48% of the calls is the cities, all support mm -hmm. of the cities. So. Um, from that point, usually guys have to they have to take care of the place just like it's home. I mean, they got to clean up, they got to wipe the aircraft down, they got to do all their uh, chores around the hangar. And in that interim, if something happens, then they uh, they respond to calls. Right. So, so um, they have kind of like a, a barracks there or a place, but they, they don't have sleeping quarters. They they uh, have their desks and, and yes. uh, things they can do out there. Um, working 12-hour shifts. Now, our hangar is positioned at the Merritt Island Airport um, over there. Um, let's say Titusville PD needs you. What's your um, – crank it up. Lift it up and fly time to Titusville. About ten to twelve minutes. Okay, to 12 so pretty centrally located, and yeah. and from yeah. the time you get the call, you can be airborne and and on scene and airborne you know. about two and a half. Okay, two and a half minutes. So now we fly what I call, and you probably have a different term for it, but we fly mission specific. If if we don't have a call going on or a need, that that bird's sitting on the ground. Yes, sir. Um, and that saves us on fuel saves us on hours um, uh, on the on the engines and everything else yes, um, from it so sitting there cold two and a half minutes later you're in the air yes sir all right yeah. so what's that like man is that a is that a just a an adrenaline rush I never get tired of flying and um, the, the flying is great but I gotta tell you the the things that it produces is actually better than the flying you know the the rescue calls are fantastic when you can rescue somebody from a bad situation is fantastic and you know, um, I gotta say, I never get tired of catching people that do things wrong. So, right. yeah, you guys get to watch it from the the, yeah. the best yeah. seat in the house. You know, so. it is it is the best seat. In the That's house. the scariest seat too. I don't know if folks realize, but do, do these things have doors on them or? or you just kinda, no, there's no doors on. It, no you air just conditioning. Hanging out the side. So you you know your seat belts are holding you in. Yeah. So and that brings a great point. Our helicopters, um, they're all brand spanking new, right? We just got them. Uh, um, they're a little bit old. Yeah, they're, they're so a like a little bit old, like like you or <laughs> one was built in 1968. It's been shot down twice in Vietnam, so it's a little bit old, but it's vintage. <laughs> okay, that's the one that Jay needs to fly in. <laughs> uh, it's already so it's crashing. In, in all seriousness, <laughs> most of our um, unit was um, uh, saw saw time in Vietnam or in um, one of them one has. of the, the other conflicts. Yeah, one of them has. That one actually went to Desert Storm too. The other ones were built. For the 
for Vietnam, but they never saw any time in Vietnam. Right. So, so built back in the late 60s, early 70s? Yes, sir. And uh, what do we fly? What what type of platforms do we have? OH-58, so they look like a Bell 206 helicopter, very similar to it, a little bit of, little difference in its size and the blade size on it and all, but very similar to a 206. So the OH-58s are four-seaters? Yes, sir. And then we have two Hueys as well, right? We have one Huey we haven't done anything. We've just been kind of working on to prepare it someday for firefighting that we got from the GSA program. Uh, eventually, in another two years, we own the aircraft. So, um, And the other Huey we use for firefighting and rescue work. Okay. And, so let's talk about that GSA program, because that's, you know, in, in almost every episode we do, we talk about how much money our team saves the taxpayers. Um, we're operating these five helicopters essentially on on go ready to go 24 hours a day 365 days a year um we we operate i, I want to say one time you and i were talking and like if you take away the the salaries and the benefits from the personnel we're at like hundred ninety five thousand dollars a year operational cost yes we are yeah how how i, I mean anybody that knows anything about local that's got to be fuel right I yeah, um, yeah, actually, that includes fuel, hangar, yeah, insurance, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that includes everything, but the uh, the way to do that is, is the military does have a program that supports us, so we're able to look for parts. And in that program, the nice part about looking for parts is that um, a typical day for me would be the mechanic telling me what things we're going to need coming up in, in maintenance. Okay. So um, we needed a turbine wheel last week, so we called the Pasadena Police Department. We knew that they had turbine wheels, a specific one. They needed some parts for their rotor head that we had, so we sent them rotor head parts. They sent us a turbine wheel, $13,000 turbine wheel for nothing. The parts didn't cost us anything. We sent them, so that's right. the kind of thing that helps everybody, the whole right. program. So the GSA or the 1033 program, as, as we yes. call it, when we buy an OH-58 from the military, um, and really we say we buy it, but we we could never sell it. We couldn't get rid of it. It's their their. Um, uh, unit, so to speak. Depends on which program. GSA, we can we can own an adventure. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when we buy one, what are we paying for it? Um, well, for example, like the GSA helicopter, the UE was five thousand dollars, but in another two years, you own it. It's worth about seven hundred thousand dollars. So we're buying a fully operational Huey helicopter for five thousand dollars. That's what we paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, we buy a couple others that we cannibalize. Yes, parts. occasionally we do that for a thousand dollars. We we buy one. We see one on the on on site where it has all the components on it. We'll buy it for a thousand dollars, and we'll we'll remove all the components and and use those components. A lot of them will have to be overhauled, but it'll save us a lot of money. Wow! So anybody that knows anything about aviation or the cost of flying, when when we say we're fully operational, minus salaries and benefits of of our members, at one hundred ninety five thousand dollars a year, they're they're just scratching their head wondering how. Close to impossible, yeah, if you didn't have some support and through the programs that we have and the yeah. way we operate. You know? And and there was a time where they started taking away the 1033 program uh, from us, and and our, our, our president has made sure that that program is back in operation in the GSA yes. program, and, and we're, we're able to, to take advantage of that. And it's not just, um, you, you, said, you talked about sitting at your computer ordering parts. You're, a lot of what you do, too, is not just on the aviation side. You're looking for all sorts of stuff for our, our agency. That's the nice part of it, yeah, some of the things that the military gets rid of. And it's everything you can imagine from kitchen stuff to trucks and cars and everything else that we can yeah. get our hands on. In fact, some of the golf carts you were talking about earlier, I don't know if it was one of them we got from, but we got <laughs> three or four of them a couple of years ago. And yeah. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know half of what you had out there. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> but, what I'm thinking too. So. <laughs> but uh, no, a lot of the support equipment and things like that um, have been the same thing yeah. gotten from the military. I mean, I mean, that program is absolutely amazing, and it, it really does save the taxpayers a lot of money. So I know, for example, not long ago, we got like a refrigeration unit that during one of the hurricanes when we yeah. lost power we we almost lost all of our perishables in the in the freezer unit out there so you were able to to get us one that that's ready to on standby to to use and stuff yeah i think we got a few of them actually and i think we paid uh, about a thousand dollars a piece i think those units were almost forty five fifty thousand dollars a piece right yeah because they're full cargo containers they're, oh, yeah. they're, they were yeah. brand new they yeah. had generators in them and everything they were amazing yeah. amazing wow. units yeah. and so i mean anything from even uh one of our previous shows we we talked about the chain gang 
the boots that the chain gang wears um, uh, you get yeah, from the, get from the military. Yeah, you get boots sometimes, yeah. yeah from the military. So, uh, so tell, tell me a little bit about that because I've heard stories, and, and I know a few folks in, in aviation with, oh, come out and fly with us, come out and fly with us. And I always say no because I hear there's, there's a drill or a train drill where you, we go up to a certain height and you just turn it off. And you just well, people like you, we do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how does that that, that blows my mind? You sure, just go up me there to do that for you know. And you just okay. turn the helicopter off, yeah, and they're able know, to just uh, bring that puppy down, no problem. You know, the aircraft were designed to be able to do that, and it's not as uh, it's not as amazing as you would think. The people that designed the aircraft were the amazing people that designed them to do that. But yes, you can cut the power on a helicopter and land. John, I think you misunderstood Jay. I don't think he was saying it was amazing that you could do it. I think he was saying it's scary as heck. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, more it's not that. Why would you do that? It, it's yeah. not that bad. And uh, and the and the reason why is if you do lose a, an engine, you can obviously you can land the helicopter without the engine. Wow. Every, the, the aircraft's designed so if you lose the tail rotor blade, you can still operate the aircraft and land it. You lose the main rotor blade, and that's usually the end of your day. So yeah, that's yeah, about yeah. it. But yeah. other than that, it can pretty much do some pretty amazing stuff. Look at these. We've got four more. Yeah. 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 One helicopter. Yeah. They're yeah. cheap, right? Yeah, they're cheap. Yeah, so so um, let's talk about a mission. Um, uh, we have any type of um, in-progress call, a, a violent crime. Could be anything from a bank robbery to um, one of our deputies in pursuit of a stolen car. Um, walk me through that. What happens? Well, um, pursuit of a stolen car, we'll start with that. Um, nice part about pursuit of, of a stolen car with a, a helicopter is, is, as you're aware, we don't chase stolen cars anymore, as a rule, depending on what the situation is. I mean, if, if it's something that has more to it than the stolen car, or if it's a danger to the public, obviously it changes the situation. But what we do do is we end up putting the aircraft up in the air on top of the car, and then we, you know, strategically place some deputies throughout the county in the direction the car is going, and we watch the car until it comes to a point where we can stop the vehicle somewhere by different means, whether we have to use stop sticks or whether we just wait and see that if the vehicle pulls in somewhere, and then we surround the vehicle and capture the people, which usually results in much safer, a much safer situation in the county. So, STAR gets in place, and now we start pulling deputies back. So the deputies are not having to drive at high speeds or anything else, and hopefully the car slows down when they see the deputies drop mm -hmm. off and stuff. And now you're you're the eye in the sky watching them wherever they go, and um, they most times they don't even know you're there, right? They don't know we're there. We stay up high and far away from the car. The cameras allow us to see the car from great distances. You couldn't, you would if you looked out the window, the helicopter would look like a speck in the sky from where we're at. So. Well. <laughs> So let's talk about the cameras and, and uh, the FLIR unit, um, the, the forward-looking infrared that, that we have in them. Um, those units are, are not cheap um, in any capacity. No, they're expensive. We were lucky. We got them on grants through grant programs when we purchased them years ago. Uh, I think now we're starting to look at some updated cameras, the possibility of putting those in. They're starting to get a little tired. But they're still amazing technology. They're, they're, they're amazing cameras. Right. So. And so they're, they're infrared, so at night, once you lock on something, it's it's there. Yeah, they also have a laser in them where you can fire the laser, and the laser will, will hit the target so that the guy, the pilot next to him, is wearing night vision goggles. And, and with those night vision goggles, you can see exactly where the camera's pointed. Uh, <laughs> I'd imagine someone listening, like, they got a laser? What are you talking about? Now <laughs> yeah, we got yeah, a laser. Yeah, you know, you, you point it, and you can hit the guy. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's in, the technology is getting... Pretty, pretty good. I'm really right. amazing, actually. So, so um, you're up in the air. You're you're seeing all this happen. Do you become kind of the director of what's happening on the ground, telling the units where well, to go? The supervisor's still in charge of everything on the ground, but um, sometimes, just depending on the situation, it's easier to say something quick and be able to say the guy's going this way or he's doing that, and at least let the supervisor make some better decisions on what he wants to do. But supervisor on the ground is ultimately in charge. Uh, we kind of take over when the guy is running north, south, east, and west and jumping over fences and, you know, and try to give the supervisor a picture, too, of what's going on as far as how dangerous, say, a vehicle is getting when he is fleeing from deputies or even when the deputies aren't on him anymore and the guy decides he's just going to still drive like a lunatic. So um, then the supervisor on the ground can make better decisions to keep the public safe. It's kind of neat. I don't, I don't know if you've seen any of the video footage or anything, but... Um, uh, what's really neat is when they bail out of the car or they, they're running mm -hmm. and you see the deputies chasing them and then all of a sudden you see one of the canines 
past the deputies <laughs> and and on on the FLIR you're looking at this canine that's yeah. that's uh coming after the guy and then all of a sudden the chase is over. It's, uh, it's kinda of really neat to watch. Kinda of looks like a guided missile actually. Yeah, it does. It does. It actually it really does. does. So, so um I know we do water rescues. We talked uh, briefly about that. Historically, we did them out of an OH-58, um, yes, and we'd, we'd actually physically landed in the water on pontoons. Yes. And uh, that, that uh, I, you know, I think a lot of times we see on TV or whatever, you see a, a helicopter or a plane landing in water, you think, oh, that's cool, they're just sitting right on the surface. But that gets a little bit more dicey than, than most people would, would imagine. Why so? Well, it, it's, um, it, it's difficult. If, you're not, if you don't start to get some experience in that type of aircraft, it's difficult to keep it in one spot. Your references get to be difficult if you're way out in the middle of a lake or not near anything. So um, you have to be very careful with float helicopters not to move them too far sidewards or you'll end up tipping them over. Um, so it, it is a little bit more dangerous to float helicopter operate in water. Mm -hmm. um, but it can also land in marshy areas too where you couldn't land before. A lot of the rescues, it's not just um, that, you, you know, uh, say a med helicopter couldn't get to you because the ground's not hard enough, but that helicopter will be able to land in the muck right. and pick you up, which we've done many a times with people with heart attacks and broken backs and shot and everything else, at least get you out of a bad situation and get you somewhere where you have some medical attention. Okay. Now, fast forward, we have the, the Huey now, and we've started to really kind of transition to doing um, rescue operations out of it because it has the the winch on it and yes so um, how does that change our training dynamic um, before we're landing our tactical flight officers stepping out onto a pontoon now they're being hoisted down well it, it takes away uh, we think it's a little safer than what we were doing before obviously otherwise we wouldn't have transitioned in that direction um, the UE also the nice part about the UE is you know a lot of times when a boat sinks I'll give you one example. You might have been at the hangar, actually, but I remember a family with two children and two adults that mm -hmm. were out in the middle of the lake one time. We picked them up, and, you know, we had to come back a second time. But the Yui will just keep filling people up. It'll take a lot of people to, to make the Yui. Yeah. Um, so you can just keep pulling people, where the OH-58, um, you couldn't do that. And, and it's very rare that a boat's just going to have one or two people in it. Right. Most of the time, yeah. four or five people in a boat. So, so um, kind of to explain the difference, the OH-58... Seats four, Huey seats. It'll take two pilots and, and 11 people in the back if you had to fill it full. Right. So I, I think one of the other things that I really love about the Huey too, especially in those type of, of applications, is um, our partners from Brevard County Fire Rescue who have a station right immediately near our hangar. Yes. They, when we have those type of calls, they come over and they load up and go out with us. And, and that uh, is fantastic because in the beginning when we first started the program years and years ago with the OH-58, you know, we get the scenes where people are injured severely, you know, plane crashes and things like that. So now these guys jump in with us and they take over the medical part of it. Yeah, excellent. So it works out good. So I, I know we're uh, short on time, but I, I can't let you get out of here without, um, uh, out of everything and all your years of, of flying and everything else, funnest, um, uh, most adrenaline rush um, uh, event that you remember. Um, I remember chasing a bank robber one time. It was a very unusual uh, case. He, he'd robbed the bank right near the Melbourne Square Mall. A woman actually took a picture of him going in because she bought the camera over at the mall just before that. So she watched him go in with a, a mask over his head and a gun in his hand. So uh, the Melbourne Police Department surrounded the area. He ran out into the woods and a canine showed up and the, the Melbourne dog said, well, I, I think somewhere in this general area where these palmettos were, um, he might be in here. Well, if you get in palmettos about six feet high, we used a helicopter downwash to blow the palmettos open. And that's what we started to do. We started to blow them open. And um, as we started to do it, I, I said, you don't see that every day. And I watched the guy pop out of the bushes and he had a bag of money in one hand, a gun in the other and a mask on. And he took off running in front of the helicopter down a path with the, the dog chasing him. <laughs> so that was kind of unusual. The ending was, un, was, uh, was not good for him, but... Uh, yeah. He ended up getting shot, actually. He, he tried to uh, um, stab one of the officers or oh aimed a gun at one of the officers. They ended up shooting him. But um, but you don't see stuff like that every day where you see a guy run out of the woods with a bag and the... Bag and the yeah, mask. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like your snapshot, yeah, yeah. your typical... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, John, we're out of time. But, but um, before we close out, I just uh, I want to personally thank you, man, not, not only for what you do every day for this agency, but for what you do with this community. With I, I know how long you sit at those computers trying to get parts and everything else to save um, save money and uh, to help make the agency work as well as it does. So you and the team out there are obviously not only a huge part of, of keeping everybody safe, but a huge part of what we're able to do here at the Sheriff's Office. So thanks for being with us. And as always, we uh, we want to thank our audience for being with us. And um, Jay, another great show, man. Right. And uh, thanks you for being here. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time on On The Go with BCSO.